for organizing that and also for giving me a chance to, to speak here. Um, what I want to talk about today is uh, a new scheme of entangling lines via ripback interaction. Uh, it's actually not a scheme, I want to, want to show experiments in that respect. Uh, and uh, what you see, you see <laughs> is actually the, the ion trap that we are using, it's a macroscopic linear pole trap, and uh, everything is at room temperature. And if you look closely, maybe you can see a slight blue spot in the center. That's actually a very picture of here. So it's, I think, a 12 ion string. It was taken in Innsbruck at that time when we set it up. And uh, we see from the other side of the picture. OK, so what we want to do, of course, uh, you already made quite a bit of advertising for us. And uh, the main idea is actually this, or partially this idea, and uh, it was proposed in, in Peter Zoller's group, Igor Mazanowski and Martin Müller, some of the main uh, people involved in that in 2008. The idea is to combine ripback ions, uh, ripback atoms schemes and uh, trapped ion schemes, so basically to, to use the really good quantum control of trapped ions and the strong ripback interaction for entanglement. So why is it interesting? Basically because Rydberg atoms and ions have really, really special properties. Uh, so uh, the electron wave function, of course, gets really, really big. For instance, if you have here the, the five atom house ground state wave function of strontium, then this is something like 0.4 nanometers, which is basically, compared to the size of the Earth and the Sun, uh, that's basically the relationship between n equal to 30 principal quantum number to like this. So 30S is, of course, not really a high ripback state. In principle, you want to eat a And uh, since the radius of this uh, uh, electron wave function scale is n to the power 2, it gets bigger. Due to that, it also gets very special properties. For instance, lifetime scales is n to the power 3, and the porosability is n to the power 7. So it's really, really strongly polarizable, basically because, of course, the core and the electron wave function, they can be actually quite a bit displaced as soon as the, as the electron is actually far away. Okay, of course, on the other hand side, you want to put such a system now in an ion trap, and uh, the main problem there is, of course, you want to trap it with electric fields. And usually, rhythmic atoms are extremely sensitive to electric fields, and you might think, is that really a good idea? Because uh, the, the electric fields get really, really strong. But if you look a little bit closer, of course, you're trapping the ion usually at the center of this quadrupole potential, which is basically a position where the electric field is zero. Uh, so if you do proper micromotion compensation, you're really properly here in the center, and then even oscillating electric field should be zero, just you have a quadrupole field. Of course, the electron wave function is quite big. And it might actually sample part of this quadrupole field, and due to that, that might be extra. Okay, so of course, if you want to excite ions into Rydberg state, as Igor already pointed out, you need to excite them to an energy level that's quite high up, up in, in energy. So if you go through a different uh, uh, species that are standardly used for ion trapping, then you see that uh, if you want to excite it with a single photon transition, you need on the order of 100 nanometers for exciting the So this is, of course, not an easy laser to, to build and to use. But uh, there was this heroic experiment in Mainz that uh, actually used a laser at 123 nanometers for exciting ions into Rydberg states, in that case, calcium ions. And uh, they were the first ones to excite ions in an ion trap into Rydberg states. We wanted to go a little bit different direction because we don't have such a laser around and of course it's not easy to build one. So what we wanted to, to do or what we plan to do is uh, to use a two photon excitation starting from this meta state of D state in strontium 88 and uh, then use a 243 nanometer laser to excite first to 63 plus and then from there with another tunable laser between the 4 to 3 and 9 nanometers to uh, principal quantum number n32 infinity basically of ns or nd states. Uh, ns or nd states. So that's the, the transition the, the transition set of dipole of course. That's what is easy to try. 
from the rip-back state or from the intermediate state, of course, you will have uh, spontaneous emission. And if you calculate the transition rates, actually, you will figure out that uh, approximately 95% of the population ends up in the S state in the end. So basically, what that means, if you start in D state, you excite it to rip-back state, and then you wait for some time, you will end up in the state. And by that, you can also easily detect the ripple excitation by just doing fluorescence detection here, driving this transition here from S to Q on us. And if it's fluorescing, then you know there was something excited in between. So if it's not fluorescing, nothing else. OK. So one of the two lasers that we're using for 200, the 243 nanometer laser is the frequency quadruple uh, laser, dial laser from 970 to 243. It's a commercial system. We get, in the end, 30 milliwatts is, we still need to push it a little bit. If you push it really hard, it's probably 100 milliwatt. But uh, then it will actually decay within a couple of hours to half an hour. Okay, so it's not really stable. Of course, there's now lasers that are more stable than that, more also commercial lasers. Or you can look up the literature. Actually, there's sources available that go up to a watt or something. OK, so second excitation step was this tunable laser, 305 to 309 nanometers. And we actually modified the standard beryllium ion with a beryllium laser system for some frequency generation of a, a, a telecom and something that's almost telecom laser uh, to reach something like 610 to 620, and then down here to here. So in the end, we get, well, 75 milliwatt is probably quite conservative, so we can get up to 100 milliwatt. And it's really nicely stable, so that's nice. Uh, what we do then is uh, a ripback excitation by these two lasers, and we shine them from opposite directions. Basically, the reason for that is that we want to be in an effective lamp ticker regime. And of course, if you get two momentum kicks, kicks from opposite direction, you basically almost not have any momentum kick. And that means uh, you are nicely into the lamp ticker regime with a ripback excitation, and you don't get any more momentum to double it. OK, if we do that, and first, just the first step, you see nicely the resonance when we uh, transfer populate from the initial state to the 5S state, just going wildly to the state. The value fits more as nicely with the theory value that we had before. And uh, yes, that all fits nicely. If you want to also to send in a second laser, what happens is that the two upper levels also get coupled, and you've got an auto count effect. And basically, by the auto count effect, you can Measure the Rabi frequency of the OK, if you then have the outer count effect, it's quite natural also to use coherent, uh, do some type of coherent excitation. And what we did is uh, a stimulated Raman Ali passage. So we started at initial state. We first switched on the upper coupling and then slowly the lower coupling. And by that, the, the counter to the pulse sequence, what we do is we transfer the population from the initial state to the required state aliphatically uh, via this almost dark state. Because, of course, it's not a real dark state because the final state is So you have uh, the coupling here follows aliphatically that state, and from initial and zero state, which is true. We can do that now, and of course, if we transfer population into Rydberg state, we see actually that almost no population is left in the initial state, because when we then wait for some time, of course, it decays to the initial state. Some population might come back, but most of the population decays to the initial state. If we then uh, want to know what is really in the Rydberg state, what we then do is we transfer population up, and after some time, we transfer population down again. And if we do that, then we can bring something like 60% population back down, which means uh, something like 80% is for signal transfer. Uh, we can also do that with a delay time, and by that we can basically measure the lifetime of the ripback state. In that case, it was something like 2.3 microseconds. Theory value would be something like 3.5 microseconds, uh, which is basically uh, the, the natural lifetime plus black body radiation, so including black. So these stir up pulses are short compared to a microsecond? They are uh, short compared to a microsecond. They're on the order of, well, in that case, I think it was uh, yeah, a few, few hundred nanoseconds. Okay. So a 
of course, you need quite a bit of power, running frequency to drive that path. So that is really high, high transfer. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's also non high So uh, we, of course, pushed it a little bit more. And then in the end, we reached the double transfer of something like 80%, single transfer of around 90%. That's, that was almost possible at that time. We think most of the infidelity in that case was actually due to laser line width. At that point of time, we had uh, a laser line width of uh, maybe something like 100 kilohertz of both of these lasers, and that was basically limiting the adiposities. So, uh, from lifetime limitation, we would have expected. Okay, now we want to have uh, interaction between these lines, Rydberg lines, and uh, the problem that we have with Rydberg lines is that the core is actually doubly charged. And due to that, the electron wave function is closer to the core, and that means the van der Waals interaction also gets smaller, and it actually scales as set, the core charge, in our case, to a set to the power of minus six, which means in Rydberg ions, what you would usually have are a few megahertz of interaction with Rydberg atoms. Here it's actually a few tens of kilohertz. And to, compared to the lifetime of these Rydberg states of a few microseconds, it's just a So due to that, what we need to do is we need to actually induce dipoles and then really go to a dipole-dipole. What we do is we try now transitions between NS states and NT states uh, to generate dress states. And S and T dressed. And these dress states have actually an oscillating type of So uh, I will explain that a little bit more in, in a minute. And what you then have is, of course, a resonant basis is a dipole dipole interaction between two such oscillating dipoles next to each other. And that is strong enough, can go into an error. It's a precision. Frequency that we need to drive this transition for 46S. It's 120 gigahertz, it's quite strong, quite quite high frequency, but uh, there's also a limit. So what we use as a source is a frequency multiplied microwave source. And the nice thing about that is that's really stable in frequency, and also stable in power. Uh, well, we still have a little bit of fluctuations in power that hurts us <coughs> at the moment, but we we will work. So what we have is just a horn here that emits this microwave radiation at 120 gigahertz. And then we focus it by normal gold mirrors into the ion trap. And uh, then going through the like, you know, like a normal laser, you would just focus it. Uh, of course, you have to consider 120 gigahertz is actually a wavelength of a few millimeters, okay, or centimeter, uh, which means you have to fit this microwave in, the, in the, the slit in between these plates. And of course, this will attenuate also the microwave. But uh, we get, I think, something like 95% uh, of, the, of the power in the end at the line. All of the rest is probably losses on, on the window or losses due to this delay that we can really reach. But I mean, 5% is much too much from uh, something like a milliwatt that you had initially. You get, can drive this transition with up to zero. So we had to actually attenuate first the micro power quite a lot. So what is these oscillating dipole moments? Uh, if you now drive this transition S to P, and you go to dress states, but not in a non-rotating frame, what you have is an S orbital plus E to the I omega T, P orbital. And of course, what happens then is that sometimes you have this S orbital plus P orbital, sometimes you have S orbital minus P orbital. Which means sometimes they add up above and subtract below, and sometimes in the other direction. So the electron wave function, electron is actually oscillating around the core, and what we get is such an oscillating. <coughs> okay. Um, in reality, it's a little bit more complicated. You, of course, drive here a sigma transition. Due to that, you actually get a rotating dipole instead of a linear dipole oscillating. And uh, what we then do is, of course, we put two of such ions next to each other in the micro in the ion trap apply this microwave field perpendicular to the, to the uh, conversation axis, and then you get rotating dipoles that are actually rotating around the conversation axis. OK. Now, uh, if we go to these stress states, you have this microwave coupling, 
inside by twofold on excitation. And then we can actually probe these stress states up here, the microwave coupled stress states, by two photon <coughs> transitions. And what we see here is again an outer town splitting of these microwave stress states. We have the plus state and the minus state of this S plus P and S minus P. And uh, the interaction, of course, is strongest when you really have a symmetric S and P superposition. Which means here the interaction, if you want to go, have the maximum interaction, you would go on resonance. Um, of course, now if you have interaction, what you would get is uh, a dipole dipole interaction or a Rydberg energy shift if both of these ions next to each other are excited. And you would expect something like a Rydberg blockade due to this energy shift. So one ion can get excited to Rydberg state, to the stress state. The second ion is shifted in energy and cannot be excited. In <coughs> okay, that's what we try now to prove that we can do that. Uh, we excite two ions next to each other to the Rydberg state. The green line is actually the curve of an only a single ion excited to the Rydberg state. And what we first do is we don't apply any microwave press. So no microwave at all. So there's no interaction. Only upon the bars, which is too weak, actually. What we then see is this is a single ion case. This is two ion case. And uh, the red curve is basically that two ions get excited. The blue curve is that one of the two ions is excited. And the red curve you would expect is actually the square of the green curve because it's just probability of one ion being excited and probability of two ions being excited, probability of two ions T squared. Okay. And if you would now square the green curve, basically it fits quite nicely. So there's no interaction. If you then apply the microwave, what will happen is that uh, these, the second transition here is shifted in energy, cannot be excited anymore. And due to that, this double ex uh, uh, excited state cannot be excited anymore. So the green curve, as before, the single ion case, and the right curve on the square. So double ionization is, is, is strongly suppressed. So we see the replication. So, yes, just to compare without interaction on the left, with interaction. Okay, now we wanted to go to a quantum gate, and uh, for making a quantum gate, we first tried actually to use this Rydberg blockade for a quantum gate, but the, Rydberg, the, the, the interaction was not really strong enough to use the, the, the shift for, for a quantum gate. So what we actually used instead is a so-called interaction gate. An interaction gate means you excite both ions really to the Rydberg state, due to the fact that you now have this interaction, this energy level is shifted in energy, and if you now wait for a certain amount of time, if time it will experience a phase, due to this energy shift. Which means, what we did is actually, uh, the, it's more or more or less the proposal from Klaus Möhm from 2014, uh, applying syrup to Rydberg state, that both of these ions get excited, and it's now combined actually with this microwave pressing, trapped ions which are proposed by the urine. So uh, we apply stirrup up and stirrup down of both of these ions at the same time. Both of these ions can get excited to a Rydberg state. And now, so this is a simulation of either a single ion being excited to a Rydberg state or both. And you see there's still quite a lot of population of both of these ions being excited to a Rydberg state. If you look at the time scale here, the whole sequence here is more or less 700 nanoseconds. So it's below a microscope. Okay. And, uh, the interaction is about 2 megahertz, 1.9 megahertz or something like that, which means in this time of 700 nanoseconds, we would get a high pitch. Um, so that's what we do. We prepare our ions in the 0 or 1 state, that's our optical qubit. Uh, and uh, then we excite the ions to Rydberg state into these microwave states. There's this interaction. If both of these ions get excited to Rydberg state, so that's 0. So of these ions get inside the Rydberg state. Due to this energy shift, they will experience this phase shift. And if only one of them gets excited, there's no interaction, no phase shift. Or if no ion is excited, also no interaction, no phase shift. So basically, you can get a controlled phase shift. OK, well, yeah, that's probably just a little bit more math of what I've said before. You can, of course, start starting in this position of 0 plus 1 in both of these ions. You can go to Rydberg state and back down, and of course, the zero zero state will appear in phase. If there is a phase of pi, it's better to control the phase gate. 
which means depending on which state, the initial state was the second line is either getting from plus to minus. So it's a control fish. We can uh, uh, detect this control phase shift. So if the first line was in zero, um, yeah, okay. so uh, yeah, here you get from the zero zero, it actually gets a minus, or you have to say plus. Uh, so this one gets a phase shift, while this one doesn't get a phase shift. So zero gives a control not, while one doesn't get a uh, control phase, while one doesn't. So if you detect the first line zero, you get one phase. If you detect the first line one, there's no phase. You can also do, after you prepare such a state here, you can rotate it into, by total pulse into a, a, effectively a belt state. And then you can do measure parity oscillations after that. And if you measure the parity oscillations on the state, then you get something like that. So, it's an entanglement operation that is operated below one microsecond time, so in 700 nanoseconds, and uh, fidelity is well, not perfect yet. We still have to work quite a lot on making that better, but it's a very really nice task. If you compare that to other gates, chapter line gates, of course that's not written like atom gates at the moment. If you compare chapter line gates, then actually there's only, as far as I know, really two gates that are below microseconds. Okay, so that's the, the Oxford group that uh, have driven the Mamosurmsen gate to really, really, really fast speed. Uh, of course, then also the fidelity drops quite a lot. It might make it a little bit slower, the fidelity is quite So, uh, but at least for sub microsecond gates, they are more or less in the of course, now the question is, can we reach somewhere, somehow further down? And uh, also maybe get even faster. And uh, if you look at the errors that we have, the Rydberg state lifetime is actually not the dominant error in all of our gates. It's only a few percent at the moment. And if you go there to make the interaction even faster, then you could even put it further. So it actually scales as n to the power of minus 7 to r to the power of 3. So if you push the, uh, the, the distance of these lines further, closer together, the interaction goes up, and due to that also, you could do all the, the process much faster. Also, laser line width, well, it's very precise error, maybe at the moment, uh, which is typical <coughs> laser line width, uh, mostly. Uh, the decay of the intermediate state and non adiabaticity also contribute quite a bit. So basically, non adiabaticity you can fight by making the radio frequency of your lasers higher and due to that uh, push the other levels further away so that you don't transfer so much population into the states by the stir up process. And one big contribution that we actually have is the microwave power fluctuations. Because we actually drive this transition, the, the, the microwave pressing at something like 100 megahertz radio frequency. And we are sensitive to 100 kilohertz of fluctuations of this level, which is the thousands of the actual the, the Rabi frequency that we're driving, which means we are sensitive to the Rabi frequency of this level. So maybe by using other schemes or making the power of the Rabi frequency of the microwave much it's more stable, we can suppress this error. Okay, um, maybe one last point here, due to the, the, the error due to the motion. So effectively you have an interaction, and the interaction is of course now repelling or tracking. <coughs> Due to that, you of course also couple to the motion of the ion string. And you can calculate that for the number of ions, how much error you would actually have as a contribution. And since our ions are actually really tightly trapped, you actually don't couple to the motion so much. So there's not so much uh, uh, information going into the motion. And due to that, you have not much of an error due to this coupling. To the so this is not a significant error. And even for longer ion strings, <laughs> So that was calculated by even by. Uh, you will find more details in this. Okay, I still have two, three minutes maybe. <laughs> um, okay, so as Igor was already explained a little bit yesterday, the ions are highly polarizable, and due to that, in the electric field, if they move a little bit, they are polarized, and due to that, the uh, trapping potential is slightly more. It means uh, in the ground state there's one trapping potential, in the reflex state there's another trapping potential. 
And you can detect it by the energy shift of these transitions depending on the phonon number that you're. We can measure this resonance shift for different phonon numbers, and of course, if you're Doppler cooled, you will have actually a distribution of populations here of these phonon numbers, and due to that, a line with broad enough of your transition. So this is basically the coherence process, because depending on your phonon number, you have a different <coughs> presence that you're trying. Uh, so that's the line that's broadening that you will experience. And due to that, we have actually, in our two-line entanglement operation, we have performed double cooling. There's uh, side cooling. So we didn't do only double. But, and of course, also if you look, for instance, for radio oscillations or something like that, if you do sideband cooling, you see nice radio oscillations. For a Doppler cool line, it's basically decoherent. But if you now go to these dressed levels of the microwave dress grid that states, this is now these levels that we use in these two line entanglement operations, and this is the S level. So just S or S plus P or S minus P. So you see the parasitability actually goes in the other direction. And if you tune your microwave accordingly, you can actually reach the parasitability of your rip-back state that is almost zero. Of course, then you don't have the perfect S plus P equals superposition and the maximum interaction anymore, but it's actually something like 50% of the interaction. So you can go to the zero parasitability. And if you do that, for instance here, it's not nice radio oscillations, but it so you see a little bit of a hint. So this is uh, S state with sideband cooling. That was the S state without sideband cooling. And this is the zero porosability state without sideband cooling. So you can drive radio oscillations into the zero porosability state, uh, even though you're not in the OK, the interaction. Of course, if you look now, how does it scale, actually, the interaction? Of course, it scales with the distance to the power of minus 3. Which means, if you push the ions closer together, everything speeds up. <coughs> uh, and uh, if you now go to more and more ions, in principle, the outermost ions actually push the ions closer together, and due to that, the interaction goes up. So if you go to a longer ion string, the interaction should be faster. Um, okay. I skipped that. That's too much. And what we now did is um, we went to a 12 ion string and only used the trend center two ions and we went to the zero porosability states. We did, apart from that, a complete uh, equal sequence that we had before. Now the ion distance, instead of 4.2 micrometer, is 3.3 micrometer. Due to that, we have a speed up that is compensating for these um, the, the zero porosability states, and we apply the same sequence apart from that. And when we do that, pretty much in data, of course, it's not really nice fidelity, but we can still get a little bit of entanglement just from a double cooled string, 12 ion string with two center ions. OK, to summarize, um, I showed you the rip -block blockade to two ion entanglement, milder rip interaction. There's quite strong emotional effects. And there's the first entanglement signal also for a 12 ion string, which is equally fast as actually for a two ion string, uh, and can be used for just double of course, we still have to work on fidelities quite a bit to make that interesting, really, for quantum computation. But uh, we know quite a bit of errors that we can work on. Most of them are technical. And uh, I think we can do quite a bit. These are the people working on it. There's she, Fabian, and Jared as students. And uh, Jared is postdoc at the moment, uh, doing the work mostly. And even like in my Then, thanks for your attention. And I'm Um, so I've got two related questions. One is, do you see uh, uh, the excitation to the Rydberg influence the lifetime of ion in the trap due to collisions, enhanced collisions with background atoms or black body? And the second is, the um, I know that in the Rydberg community, people have also performed gates not by exciting to Rydberg levels, but rather by dressing the ground state with some Rydberg excitation and then limiting the 
of the population in the Red Black State? Of course. Uh, okay. So first, first question <laughs> is uh, yes, we see double ionization by black body radiation mostly. So we think that's black body radiation. Radiation. Uh, the rates that we see fit with uh, black body radiation. Radiation uh, ionization. Uh, what we get is, in, if you just excite the Rydberg state in weight, in something like 1 of 300 Rydberg excitation, we lose the ion by double ionization. So we just get a double ionized ion here. Nice thing is, we can actually throw it out quite easily, just by changing the trap parameters. And then the double ionized ion fly, fly out, and we can just by patient loading load in the ion. Okay, so that's it's possible. Of no course, it's an additional source of error. No enhanced chemistry? Uh, we haven't seen anything there. In, uh, I think uh, we only have seen uh, WIR science and no, no strong signal. Yeah. Um, of course, you can suppress black body radiation quite a bit by just going to consciousness. So, in principle, the theory, many, many ways of magnitude are possible by just going to uh, Second question was. Uh, concerning driving gates by not going to the Redberg excitation, okay. but rather mixing some Redberg Of course, you could do that. Of course, uh, that I don't think you can win infidelity so easily, uh, but of course, you're losing speed. So that's why we can do it. The long iron chain, uh, I'm just wondering how do you select only two ions? So we have a, a, a laser that only excites the um, to center ions into S plus D states, and only D, the D state, of course, gets excited. All the other ions stay in S, and due to that, they are not excited to reflect state. So we have an address 674 laser that tries to keep the transition. That's all. The, the Rydberg excitation is done by a virtual I have a question on the role of the RF field. Does this create sidelines on the Rydberg transition and influence the pocket? Um, <clears throat> for uh, S and P states, there's not so much of sidelines that are appearing. So there's an, uh, we, we rather so for D states, you couple actually in the manifold of um, of D uh, three R or something like that, the different Siemens levels, and due to that, you get quite a lot of floppy sidelines. Um, for S and P's two and half levels, it's not so critical yet because all the other levels that you could couple to are quite far away, and due to that, there's almost no sidelines. But it's it's a quadruple couple, quadruple couple anyway. Of course, if you then would shift it out of out of the center, you have also a type of electric field, and then of course you would see that. Yeah. About this zero probability, I didn't fully really understand. So one case is uh, plus addition of SNP, the other case is uh, minus addition. Yes. And in between them. So it's just a, uh, so basically you go to the stress states, you detune a little bit from resonance. And due to that, you get an a mixture of P that is not equal to one to, to one half okay, or so population. Uh, but depending on where you are in this. In this uh, other towns uh, scheme here, ah, no, yes. depending on where you are, it's either here's s plus no, s minus p, here's s plus p, and if you go a little bit here or here, then you're in, in a different sort of position. But you you just tune your two photon resonance to this point. You would put your your micro tuning to I don't know plus or minus 5 megahertz or something like that and try to resonate inside to the stress state. Can I go first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, perhaps a similar question than uh, what, what Oli asked. Um, like this, this classical gate scheme, and the, like the first proposed, I think, was based on the blockade. Yes. Are you actually not bring mm -hmm. Those are absolute. And like, if I'm not totally wrong, I think that would also make it insensitive to the microwave power. It would make it insensitive to microwave power, that's correct. Yes. Right. So um, you, then you would gain 10%? Or so we, a reason you don't we didn't have, uh, so the, the reason why we didn't use the, use the blockade gate is uh, usually for blockade gates you need either an addressed operation or uh, we tried, for from non-addressed, we tried with composite pulse sequences. Mm -hmm. 
But then uh, what we needed to do is rotating around the effective block axis x and y one after the other. And then if you change this basis, actually you don't really drive it perfectly up, up anymore. And uh, if there's no pl perfect blockade, then you actually have to consider more levels. And then but I think there's now, in Lukens group, they have uh, done also something similar that actually should also work. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll skip that. And we certainly will try. So we have we, exactly we are in a, in a rootback state, and the rootback state is sensitive to the black body radiation, and then we lose the electron there. Due to that, we have then just a double ionized ion inside, and of course we cannot use it for any quantum information anymore. We have to get rid of it and and so uh, on. Um, but uh, of course, um, black body radiation can be suppressed. But uh, it's basically limited in our, all our measurements at the moment. All the statistics that we have, the, the error bars are often quite big compared to other experiments in black times. That's basically due to the sometimes. <coughs> well, John. So, is, is, so looking at this diagram now, I forget if this is what you did the gate on. Is, is the setting plus 46 for the bird state the optimal end? No, and I don't think that n, n plus 46 is the optimal n. Uh, it's a level that we were conveniently able to work with. But uh, we have gone already to n equal to 56, and uh, if we do proper micromotion compensation, I think we could also use n equal to 56. So, and then, of course, the, all the interaction would go quite a bit up, because uh, the interaction was with n to the power 4, and it would increase the interaction. And we will try that, but uh, at the moment we just use it. One last question. There are these higher angular, state, <coughs> angular states of Rittbergs where you gain in lifetime. So it, it, just out of curiosity, why is nobody aiming to get there? <coughs> so the, 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 it's, it's actually connected to these floquet sidebands that we were that I said before. Uh, the in, in the high angle momentum states, you actually have coupling of the of the different levels, also of low angular moment, two lower angular momentum, wire the uh, the quadrupolar coupling, by electric fields of the quadrupolar, and this mixes all of these levels. And due to that, the lifetime might not be so good anymore. We've tried to calculate a little bit. Uh, there might be levels that are still longer lived, uh, and uh, of course, at some point, we will need to investigate it further. But then you have to go, of course, into the, uh, uh, the completely coupled system of I and trap plus, plus I and trap. So I think we have to move on to the next talk, so let's thank Marcus again.